So the, the way it'll, they'll work each time probably will be, we'll always, we'll start with a, a prayer or we'll maybe watch a, a bit of music um, and then we'll get into the kind of biblical argument for the area of, of service we're trying to be trained in. And we'll, we'll, we'll look at some doctrine or some theology as to why it's important. And then we'll get some feedback from people as we go through it. And then we'll look at the practical um, training needs um, and some practical tips and so on that we can find from people either within the congregation or outside it so that we can get better um, in these different ways. And so let me just pray and then we'll talk a little bit more um, about that from God's word. Father, we do want to praise your name for salvation. It's just wonderful that you, the God who made everything, um, you, the good God, the holy God, um, who hates sin and stays far from it, um, still chooses to relate to a sinful people. Um, and you, you've chosen to do that um, in the most precious way possible by the blood of Jesus Christ. And we praise your name that as we listen to the words of that song, um, Father, you have done something incredible. You've changed dead and cold hearts. Um, you have changed people who hated you and had no time for you into um, your children, your friends, your subjects, um, into the church. You've called us to be a people. And we want to be a people who are alive. We want to be a people who are living the way you would have us live. We want to be a people who um, love one another because we love you. And therefore, Father, a people um, who are welcoming um, a people who connect people in to the family of God. And so we pray as we look at this topic tonight now, um, that Father, through your word, by your spirit, um, you would equip us, um, you would grow us in our understanding of how we should be living as the church, but also practically you would equip us with the skills um, or some of the skills that we need to just get um, moving on that task and to keep growing in that task. You've done a lot of work in Riverside and we praise your name but we pray as we start this year, Father, that these training sessions would really help us um, to push on, Father, in the practical living of the faith that you have given us. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ and for your glory. Amen. 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 Well, it is really good having you here um, tonight. And as we begin, um, we're looking really at the importance of home groups tonight and building our grace-filled culture in Christchurch Riverside. We want to and have a, a culture in our church filled with grace and um, where we welcome people and, um, and where we connect Christians <laughs> into the body. Um, and the big point really that we just want to have on our head, and I've said already, is that just there's far more to salvation than having your sins forgiven and heaven assured. That is key to salvation. Of course it is. We need our sin forgiven and we need to have the assurance of heaven. But Christians are called into the church and they are welcomed into the family of God. And so we really want uh, 2021, 2022, we want as Christchurch Riverside to move further down that path, um, that calling that we've been, we've been given. And we want to more and more um, be a welcoming church family who connect people and get them serving and get them feeling part of the body. Now, it's important to say that God has worked already in Christchurch Riverside over many years um, as God's word's gone out faithfully to make it a welcoming place. Um, but we can definitely, definitely grow. Um, we can definitely get better at this um, and offer people more and more, offer one another more and more um, the sort of welcome that Christ offers us. And we're going to hear a little bit more about that later. So that's the big um, point. The big point is that the church, want to, we want to move further down um, that path. But there's two principles that I want to set out in front of us before we get to the practicalities tonight. So firstly, I want us to recognize the importance of people, so not necessarily Christians, but people being welcomed into our community. So I'm using my words carefully here, okay? We want to recognize the importance of people being welcomed into our community and the importance of Christians being connected into the family. So there's a welcome that you can give to anybody um, whether they're a Christian or not, and, and, they're, and they're associated with your church. And we want to recognize that's important. Um, but just as important, probably more important, is that Christians, um, whether they're new Christians or not, um, you know, brand new believers or new Christians to our church family, they need to be connected into the church family. So that's the first big principle. And I want to read then two passages from Acts, just very brief ones. 
Um, but the Holy Spirit came at the beginning of Acts um, and the church was born. Um, and this is what we read about the, the, the birth of that church and what they were like in Acts chapter 2, 42 to 47. And this is what we read. They, that's the church, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favour of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. And then we read on in chapter four, a very similar little passage, verse 32 to 37. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there was no needy person among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to anyone who had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. I don't know about you. I'm absolutely convinced that every time you've read those words, you've been hugely challenged. You know, Christians were called into a people and we're called into a devoted people. And actually we're called to be in that people very deeply indeed. You, you know, when we read those two passages, words like together, everything in common, there was no needy people, there was regular meetings, there was eating together, there was warm hearts full of praise for God. You see, these people were called in deep. <laughs> they weren't just dipping their feet in church. This was a deep calling into God's people. But is that not massively challenging for us in a, a culture in the UK where actually people more or less, they look after themselves, um, where individualism or actually a little bit more than that, it's actually me and my own nuclear familyism. <laughs> um, that's really, it's not just the individual. It's as long as you look after your family, you're doing well. That, that kind of comes first nearly every time in our culture. So how do we then as a local church, how do we carry on and improve in becoming the, the church that really we all long to be? We do long for, when we read that in Acts 2 and Acts 4, I'm sure you kind of long for the depth that is so evident in those verses and so i would i would argue that the beginning it begins by acknowledging this first principle that we're talking about we we must recognize the importance of people being welcomed into the community and the importance of christians being connected into the family i would argue that's where it begins that principle recognizing that that's really really important is where we begin and so um, i want us to listen now it's a this this will be on the screen, but it's a podcast, so it's just a listening exercise. But um, we're going to listen to two guys, Sam Alberry and Ray Ortland. Ray Ortland was one of the guys who lectured or gave the, some of the lectures at um, Union when I was studying, and he really brilliant on um, building a sort of graceful culture in church. And they're talking about this in the podcast, so we're going to listen. I think it's four or five minutes. We're going to listen to these two guys talking. And then we'll go on from there. Thanks, Tim. We can have serious enjoyment. That's okay. Yes. Now, we, we were last episode talking about the concept of gospel culture, that gospel doctrine should issue forth in and, and create gospel culture. Um, where do we see that in the Bible? Let's, let's pull out some verses. What, what has been, give us a, a, a passage or two that, really underline that connection for you? Okay. It's such an important question because if gospel culture is just our sort of clever packaging of yet another to-do list for young pastors, it will only be oppressive. But I think gospel culture is the end of our to-do lists, and it's actually entrance into the burden-releasing experience of gospel culture. For example, so where is it in the Bible? How is this not our little clever shtick? Oh, Romans 15, 7 uh, says, Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you 
for the glory of God. Romans 15, 7. Welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. I'm looking at that verse, I'm thinking, that's fascinating. Where can the glory of God be seen in the world today? Beyond the Grand Canyon and the Isle of Skye, okay? In our churches. The glory of God is seen when this happens, when we welcome one another as Christ has welcomed us. And here's what's so captivating about that to me, Sam. All this great theology in Romans 1 through 15 translates into, here's the practical cash value. Welcome one another. <laughs> Not debate predestination. That's a good conversation. But beyond that, when we get to chapter 15, it says, here's how, here's how you do this. Welcome one another. And, and Paul's not just saying, hey, guys, please be nice. Because he's saying, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you. So there's something distinctive about the welcome we're to have for one another because it's meant to be of the same species of welcome as the one Christ has shown us. Right. So saying hi to one another on the way into church from the, from the parking lot to the sanctuary, that's a good thing to do. I actually believe small talk is a big deal, and I can prove that from the book of Acts, but we'll, that's another time. But simply saying hi to one another, it doesn't work. Because how could we say, therefore, say hi to one another as Christ said hi to you? It doesn't work. What has Christ done? Now, there's the gospel doctrine, this, this, this vertical reality being revealed through the gospel. Christ has not just said hi to us. He has not just tolerated us. He has welcomed us. He has opened his very personal heart and said, I want you in my reality now. I think this is so significant. I know where I've come from, one of the, the dangers of kind of reformed evangelical churches is that we, we've turned the gospel into the cancellation of debt. We've we're preaching mercy more than we're preaching grace. So I actually went many years in my Christian life not really hearing about the welcome of Jesus. I heard about the debt-canceling death of Jesus. You're now not a problem to Jesus. I didn't hear much about what we've been saved into, into that, that welcome of Jesus. And that, that, that's so significant for how we relate to each other, isn't it? If, if Jesus is simply cancelling my debts and forgiving my sins, but that's it. I mean, that's still, that is still wonderful news. But the, the very, all that really means I'm committing to relationally, my, my vision isn't for much more than let's not have issues with each other. Mm. It's not actually putting a positive wow. energy into relational life, is it? It's what just simply saying let's, let's not be against each other because God isn't against us now. Whereas welcome is saying... Jesus has cancelled our debts, he's forgiven our sins, and he's welcomed us, as you say, he's opened his heart to us. He said, I have called you friends. He didn't say to us, um, you have won my friendship. He said, I have called you, I'm redefining you as my friends. Now, that's now how we turn to one another. It says in Romans 15, 7. Therefore, in light of all this gospel, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you. So, okay, here you are, Sam Albury. I have no right, if I'm going to say I believe the gospel and I accept the gospel and preach the gospel, I have no right to settle for a thin and shallow relationship with you. I, if you're um, interested in that, then go on the Gospel Coalition website. Um, there's loads more, and it's it's brilliant. There's a lot of podcasts on this grace-filled culture. I, I really love it, actually. Um, I think it's very, very good stuff. But you see, Acts 2 and Acts 4, and we read already, but they very much confirm to us that simply kind of saying hi to one another doesn't work. You see, as individuals, God has made us 
for more than that. And we actually long for more than that, no matter what our personality is. We, we long for more than people just say hi to us. And actually, as his body, the church, there is simply no kind of only say hi, last in, first out Sunday morning only option for a Christian. OK, there is no kind of dipping your feet in option for a Christian who's going to take their faith seriously. No, we need to be active in welcoming people into a community and connecting Christians into a family. So that's the big first principle. But the second principle that's so important and for tonight for home groups is this, this hard work of welcoming and connecting. It has to go much further than the elders and the pastor, doesn't it? And, and let me just say clearly, it is going further than that already in Riverside. And Riverside is a church that does welcome. Um, and so this is not me trying to um, say, come on, do better. This is me saying together, we all want to um, grow in this. Now, of course, the pastor, I've got a particular freedom, responsibility, ability, because I'm full-time paid to do this. I, I can be very actively involved in modeling this and getting lots of it done. But this hard work of welcome and connecting is a deliberate task that is to be organized and then carried out by the whole church. Okay, so that's our second principle. The first principle is that it matters. And the second principle is that the whole church has to be involved in this. But it needs to be deliberate and it needs to be organized. And so let me read Acts chapter 6, verses 1 to 7. Um, and this will be the, other, the only other passage we're looking at um, tonight. This is what it says. In those days, so, you know, the, the, the church is growing. In those days, when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. Also Philip, Procurus, um, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Now, it's a lovely passage that because what we're seeing, what we saw there, there was a practical ministry that was being neglected and was causing division. So the leaders, they needed to pay attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. And so this practical ministry that was being neglected, it had to be organized and it had to be carried out well by other godly Christians. Now, our elders and me as the pastor, we're definitely going to be involved in welcoming and connecting. But so that the ministry of the word and prayer doesn't get neglected in Christchurch Riverside, we've got to organize ourselves a bit better. We've got to build some structures in that are going to help us to flourish and actually prepare us to grow more. There, you know, We have been growing over the last few years, but and we need some structures that are going to prepare us to grow even more. So how do we go from these two principles um, to practical strategies that are going to result in change, Christ-exalting change, um, or ch Christ-exalting growth within our local church? And different churches will answer that in different ways. But in our context, I think the home groups are absolutely key. OK, I think there's going to be great benefit in putting more of this work deliberately into the hands of our home group leaders and through the home group leaders to the members of our home groups. To me, that seems biblical and wise, and it seems to match that pattern of Act 6. We've always got to be careful, don't we, in comparing ourselves with the early days of the church because there were some incredible things going on um, to set the whole thing going. But it seems to me that this would be a way that Christchurch Riverside could match, to some extent, the pattern of Act 6, where a practical ministry was deliberately organized and entrusted to godly spiritual Christians. You see, if I was just to preach this as a sermon from the front, um, and I said from the front that as individuals, all of you people in Christchurch Riverside should be more welcoming to newcomers, and you should try to foster fellowship with other Christians. Do you know, some of the church family would be inspired, and they would try it, and there probably would be some fruit from that, in the short term, but 
I just know what we're like. I know how quickly we forget and how quickly life comes in and we would soon go back to normal. So there might be, and this probably happens lots of Sundays when there's a, a little bit of change and then we go back to normal quite often. So some people would be inspired by a sermon saying, come on, as individuals, pull your socks up. But do you know, others in the church family would just simply feel crushed. They would feel unfit for the task. They'd think, you don't understand, I'm too shy to speak to newcomers. I'm too nervous to have people around for food and to try to foster this fellowship you're talking about. So that wouldn't be a great result, even if the sermon happened to be a very good one. Um, if that is what the result would be, it wouldn't be that good, actually, um, at all. So what would match our theology of church far better? And what I'm convinced will actually work and stick is as if we more and more at Christ Church Riverside try to put things into practice from God's word, not simply as an individual, but rather with others as part of our home group. We're sort of attempting to do that um, in some way so far by making the home groups discuss the sermon each week to give us more time um, to chew on it together. Um, but I think home groups give us a great place of confidence, a lot of help as we seek to obey God's calling us and put these things into real action. You know, so doing things together as a home group. So I'm going to talk about welcoming and connecting in a minute as home groups, because that's what we're going to, we're getting to. But, you know, doing these things together rather than trying to do them as individuals, it helps if you're shy because you'll have somebody beside you in your home group who's welcoming as well. Or it helps with people who forget names. <laughs> who doesn't forget names sometimes? But if you've got somebody beside you who's good at names, they can say, oh, I know that's Margaret. No, Dorothy's one with the glasses or whatever. I've got that the wrong way around and I've said it. But you know, <laughs> so if you forget names or if you run out of, if you're somebody who runs out of small talk pretty quickly and you've got somebody beside you who's good at it, excellent. Um, or what about this one? If a, if you, if a, a very attractive single female or single male comes in the room and you're a single person of the opposite sex, it's quite hard to welcome them because you kind of feel a bit awkward. I'm thinking, well, maybe they've gotten to think my motives are wrong here. If you've got somebody beside you, I think doing these things together, it gets past a lot of the problem. Um, and so I think doing these things together, it matches our theology because not just Anglican theology, this, I think it's biblical theology that it's the church that's to obey God's word, but actually just practically it works far better as well. So all with all of that said, thank you for listening so far. With all of that said, here's where I think the rubber hits the road in terms of practical strategies for this year. And we may build on this as we go, but here we go. I want our home groups, we've got four of them at the minute. I want our home groups to be on a welcomer's rota for Sunday mornings. Now, don't panic if you're already thinking, well, I struggle to get to church by half ten. Um, because the whole home group, it's not going to be a three-line whip where everybody has to be there or it doesn't count. But um, I think I would like home groups. And I guess I'm going to talk to the home group leaders especially about this, or I'm talking to you now about this. I would like home groups um, to be on the rota once a month um, and to try as many of the home group as possible to, to get there for 10 o'clock and to be welcomers on a Sunday morning. So um, taking people to their seats, being out in the car park, smiling at people, saying hi. OK, saying hi is not a bad thing, but we wanted to go further than that. Um, but I would love home groups to be doing that. I think if, you, if we were doing it as a home group, there's so many um, benefits from that anyway. Um, but doing it as a home group it would be a lot more confidence giving than just saying, I'm going to put you as an individual in a row. You're going to turn up and there'll be other people on the team as well, and they'll be there and you'll talk to them and then you'll do a great job of welcoming. I think if your home group is praying about this on a Wednesday, Thursday, they turn up on a Sunday morning at 10, it'll do your home group good, um, but it'll do the church family good as well. Um, so that's what I'm hoping. I'm also, another idea um, in terms of the home groups doing together, somebody gave me, um, whenever we were asking this in home groups is maybe we might end up doing a few meals in the community centre this year and asking home groups to maybe take charge of running those but we'll, we'll, we'll not run before we can walk we're going to start off with being on a welcomer's rota um, I hope anyway um, for Sunday mornings so once a month um, your home group hopefully will be on so that's strategy number one and then strategy number two I want home groups um, to be the connectors in church so there are some people, lots of our adults are in home groups, but there's still some that's not. Um, and so we want to assign all the people associated with our church family just to the care of a home group. And by that, I mean, home groups will be aware of these people's names. Um, they'll seek to talk to them on a Sunday um, and they might seek to have them around for food. They might seek to kind of draw them in um, and to pray for them. 
Um, and when new people come, rather than just me chasing them or one of the elders chasing them or Kay chasing them or whoever, um, we're going to try and say, look, could your home group care for this person? Could your home group seek to be the group of people that are going to try to get this person to feel at home in Riverside? They might not be a Christian yet, but let's get them to feel welcome in the community. Um, and then um, when they become a Christian, um, let's try to connect them properly into the different things that are going on um, in church. And as part of that second strategy, um, our first four sermons this term are going to form the basis of um, a kind of welcoming course that we can use with new people to church who want to know how to read the Bible, who want to know what we're really about as a church. The first four sermons are going to help us um, with that, and they're going to be a resource that we're going to use and develop um, for that as well. Come to, we're going to watch a little video now from a guy called Dr. Herschel York. So he's a Southern Baptist, I think, or um, he's an American anyway. Um, and just as, as, we're, as we're coming to this is like why welcoming matters. I, I guess I want you to have in your head, what might people be feeling when they come to church on a Sunday morning? So think of new people, old people, people who have battled sin that week, people with mental health issues, people who have battled to get their kids and are absolutely knackered, people with worries. How are they feeling when they come to church on a Sunday morning? But also think, how does serving with a home group, how does serving with others help us to build friendships and relationships so much quicker? So just have those things going in your head. And we're just going to watch this little video, some practical steps for how to welcome somebody to church on a Sunday morning. So fire on there, Tim. Thank you. When people visit a church, they're going to decide within the first 10 minutes whether or not they'll ever come back. So that, that means that the pastor really doesn't even get a crack at them. They've already formulated opinions and they've decided whether or not they really feel comfortable. So it is essential that a church create a welcoming atmosphere. And it really needs to begin the moment that they drive on the property. You need to have proper signage. People don't want to feel like they're, they don't know where to go and they're out of place or they're doing the wrong thing. You need to have greeters and train your greeters to welcome people, to smile, to uh, show them the way, to help them park, whatever. You need to have parking places that people can pull into that are clearly marked for first time visitors. But the real key is to train your people. You have to talk about it a lot because most people don't really know how to do it. They're uncomfortable greeting people and welcoming people. So about once a year, right up on the platform, I walk people through how to shake hands, how to say hello. I tell people in our church that they, they never have the right to be offended if someone asks them, are you a guest, even though they've been coming for years. And that's one of those things that people are afraid to greet guests. What if they've been here? So we just have a big understanding in our church that if someone asks you that, even if you've been coming here for 50 years, that you should be glad because it means that they're trying to welcome guests. The larger your church grows, the more you have to work at that. And in another sense, the smaller it is, the more intentional you have to be with it because uh, people stand out more in a small church. So whatever size your church, you really have to work on this. You have to talk about it a lot. Uh, you want to help people know what to do with their children. You need to help them know where to sit, not to feel out of place. So you really need to turn your entire congregation into a welcome team so that when they come, they feel embraced. You know, we can never lessen the offense of the gospel. Telling people that they're sinners, that they're desperately broken and in need of the grace of Jesus Christ, that's inherently offensive. And we can never lessen the offense of the, of the cross. But all the other stuff we need to work on. We don't have to be personally offensive. We don't want to get in the way of people hearing the gospel. And so if a pastor will lead the way and instruct his people and tell them that really eternity is at stake here and that the way they greet people and welcome them and invite them to sit with them, invite them out to lunch after church, all of those things contribute to those people being able to hear the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thanks for watching Honest Answers. You can submit your questions by email, Twitter, or in the comments section. No, you can't.
Um, <laughs> you just have to ask your questions. Now, or even already, the first wee bit, you may think, oh, um, you know, from what the, that comment that Joe made about, you know, being drawn in by God's word. But he is 100% right. We, you can't, you can't make the offence of the gospel any less. We're not allowed to, because that you'd stop people being saved that way. Um, but you want to try to make everything else as easy as possible. Now, I think the thing that we're trying to do that improves on that little video there um, is we're not just saying to individuals, come on, you all need to be welcomers. We're trying to say as home groups, can you make your home group into a team that is good at welcoming people? Um, and can you do that so that the shy people in your home group and the and the chatty people in your home group somehow work together. And maybe as Joe, you know, the question she put, sometimes chatty people like myself can miss the subtleties. This person's nervous. Whereas sometimes the, the more shy people can think, hold on, I know exactly what's going on here. Let's back off a little bit. So I think what he said was all very helpful. Um, but I think we can improve even on that because we'll be doing it um, as a team, as a home group. Um, together. So here's just some questions. Here's some good questions to ask when you welcome, when you're trying to welcome somebody to church. It can just be simply like this. Like, um, how are you? I, I don't think I've met you before. So if you say it like that, you're not saying, are you new here? <laughs> um, because that can be quite an intimidating question. But I don't think I've met you before. Give somebody a chance to say, no, actually, we did meet. Can you not remember? Or no, I'm new here. So how are you? I don't think I've met you before. Or you could say to somebody, and maybe you, you know they come regularly, but you don't remember their name, but you could say, have you a particular place you'd like to sit? Would you like me to take you to your seat? Or as, as Bev said earlier, you might be thinking, okay, this person here, they need to meet so-and-so. So you might say, look, have you met Brad before? Can I come and get you to sit beside Brad um, and I'll introduce you to him? Or um, something you could say is, look, oh, let me show you who Kay is. She'll, she'll help tell you all about the kids' activities. These are things that, and we can help one another to be saying to people that we either don't recognize or or new people, um, or even this is our pastor, you know, would you come and meet our pastor? If you know somebody's new, come meet our pastor, or here's one of the elders, or here's a home group leader, here's one of our leadership team. Or it can just be as simple as, look, how are you feeling this morning? It's somebody that you you know already. How are you feeling this morning? Is there anything I can help you with? Is there anything you need um, this morning? And that can sometimes be very helpful because somebody might say, do you know what I need? Um, I, I want to tell you, I, I need you to pray with me or um, I, I need to just sit at the back today. I'm not feeling well. So just trying to be sensitive, um, trying to be humble, like like what he said, try not to be embarrassed when you um, welcome somebody who's been coming for a long time. And I loved the Bethy and Vera's interaction a few weeks ago. I asked Bethy to go and talk to Vera and Vera said to me afterwards, um, oh, that was lovely. Bethy came to say hello. She ran out of things to say pretty quickly. And so did I. So then she said, I'll talk to you later. And away she went. But Vera was just really honest, you know, we both ran out of things to say to each other. But it was lovely that she tried. That's good, isn't it? Um, that's 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 I think that's a good thing. I think Vera would would be good at this. Actually, she's going to be good um, at welcoming people because she won't be embarrassed um, about things like that. So some questions that we can ask people um, when we see them in the car park um, in the morning. And this is all these are all just little skills, little helps as we seek to welcome people into church. Now, we're nearly at half past eight, and I don't want it to um, go on any further um, or any later than half past. But in terms of connecting people into church, um, in terms and the home group leaders especially, I really want us to be thinking, how can we turn our home groups into a team? How can we work together? If some people aren't good at inviting people around for lunch, can we let them help. <laughs> and somebody in our home group, could they come around and help chop the vegetables? I'm going to invite a new person in. Can we involve the home group more? Can we involve people in our home group more um, and help them to learn to serve as we try to connect Christians into the family of God? Can we do more fun things together as a home group? Can we do some good things together as a home group? Go and pick up litter together. Can we do some evangelistic things together as a home group? And the most important thing I think to end on as well is can we regularly build into our home groups and um, prayer for the people that, that we're looking out for um, and prayer for us as we seek to welcome. So the one Sunday a month that we're going to welcome that week in home group, if you can spend time praying about that, praying that it would go well, praying that would really make people feel welcome because Christ welcomes people into his church, doesn't he? He welcomes people and um, he welcomes sinners 
Uh, and then those he saves, he welcomes into his family, doesn't he? And we want our home groups to be places like that. So, sorry, that's an hour. And in the end, Joey was right. I said it'll definitely be done by a quarter past. And I probably probably end up doing too. To be fair, it's the way I normally do it, isn't it? I probably put too much words into this and maybe not enough time for reflection. But I, I learned from this as well um, as we go um, into the next monthly sessions, okay, and try to make sure that we cut down on maybe just maybe the words a little bit more so we've got a bit more space. But I hope it's been helpful. I hope it has stirred you a little bit to thinking um, in this way. But don't let this be the end of it tonight. I hope this starts a conversation. We've got a month until the next trading session, so maybe over the next few weeks we can be talking about this a little bit more. Um, and I'm hopeful that I'm going to ask my home group this Sunday, those who can, to turn up a bit earlier, <coughs> get the ball rolling um, on just being in the car park and being there to welcome people into church. You know, So um, thank you for coming. Um, and uh, let me pray. And then we'll just call it a day there. <laughs> we'll carry these conversations on. So let me pray. Father, we want to praise your name that... Um, you are the God of the universe, and yet you meet us and you welcome us into your body. You welcome us into your family because you love us, because you've paid. <laughs> and what a welcome that we have. I pray that Riverside every Sunday morning, we will really love that welcome. We will remember um, the green pastors. We will remember that, um, Father, you've done everything for us so that we can really rest in the salvation that you've given us. But I pray that, that will make us more and more into a welcoming church. I thank you that Riverside has been a very welcoming church. Um, and as Joe says there, she's felt very welcome. And many of us have felt welcomed in because many of us have come new to Riverside in the last number of years, um, ourselves included, my family. And we felt really welcomed in. But I pray, Father, that in terms of welcoming and connecting, that you would grow us in this area so that more and more Christchurch Riverside is just filled with grace um, so it's a really good people where a good place where people can come, they can become Christians and they can find their Christian family. Father, thank you for this time together. Thank you for Zoom um, and thank you for Jesus Christ. We pray these things for his glory. Amen. Amen. Amen.